I'm Marty Lafferty, and our next guest is Larry Hadley. Larry is an intellectual property attorney at McCool Smith. Larry, would you please introduce yourself and tell us a bit about what you'll be talking about today? Yeah, thanks, Marty. Um, yeah, my name is Larry Hadley. Uh, I am a principal at the law firm of McCool Smith. Uh, we have offices all around the country, uh, headquartered in Dallas. I'm in the Los Angeles office, and my practice focuses on intellectual property law. Uh, primarily patent and copyright litigation. Um, today I'm going to be talking about a rapidly developing area of patent law that focuses on what kind of inventions are eligible to be patented and what kind are not, and particularly as it applies to software. So we understand part of that is this thing called Section 101. Could you tell us about what that is, Section 101 of the Patent Act and patent eligibility? And and how that applies to all this. Yeah, Section 101 of the Patent Act is the provision of the statute that defines what is eligible to be patented and uh, conversely what is not. It's a very broad statute. It basically says that any new or useful process, machine, article of manufacture, uh, or any improvement on those things is eligible to be patented. Uh, you would think that given that definition, almost anything under the sun can be patented, um, but that's not exactly true because uh, for years the Supreme Court has read that statute and placed limitations on it. In particular, the Supreme Court has said things like laws of nature, natural phenomenon, and the thing that is most relevant to our discussion here today, abstract ideas, um, cannot be patented. How has the law changed for the software-based inventions that are really at the core of the Internet of Things? Well, the law itself, the statute has not changed. What has changed is the way that the Supreme Court and the lower federal courts have been interpreting this abstract idea concept, particularly as it applies to computers and as it applies uh, to software. Uh, for years, the Supreme Court uh, said that software was not patentable. It was viewed to be mental steps. Then in the 1980s, um, the courts began recognizing that business methods or business processes uh, were subject to patenting and were patent eligible. That lasted for a number of years uh, until about 2010 when the Supreme Court started to take this idea that abstract concepts cannot be patented and began cutting back on the types of computer and software related inventions that were subject to patent eligibility. What, so what are some of these Supreme Court cases? Well, there were three cases uh, back in the 1980s that basically said mathematical formulas are abstract concepts and they cannot be patented. But if you did something beyond the mathematical concept itself, so the focus of the invention was on an inventive idea as opposed to a mathematical concept, then that could be patented. In 2010, the Supreme Court decided a case called Bilski. And in that case, the Supreme Court said that a, essentially a formula that was used for in, by investors to um, have a, an advantage in de making investments, in particular in the hedging area, uh, was too abstract to be patented. And it found the patent invalid. Uh, after that, there were a series of two cases in the, me in the medical arts mm -hmm. field that found um, inventions invalid, like DNA sequencing, and uh, certain blood tests because they were the inventions were essentially laws of nature. Last year, the Supreme Court decided a case called Alice uh, versus CLS Bank. And in that case, the court uh, applied these concepts from the medical field, again, to computers and software, and said that a patent on uh, basically uh, an escrow type of an arrangement to make sure that both parties complied with the deal before money was transferred could not be patented because it was too abstract. And in doing that, the Supreme Court set up a two-part test for determining 
what is too abstract to be patented and what can be patented. T tell us a little bit more about that two-part test because that's critical to the Internet of Things software developers. Well, I, I wish I could, but the Supreme Court uh, really left this two-part test very open-ended. The test itself is almost circular in nature. Um, it said that the Supreme Court said the first thing that, that you need to do is look at the invention as a whole and see if it can be essentially reduced to what it describes as an abstract concept. The Supreme Court said, we're not gonna tell you what that is, but in that particular case, it said that a fundamental or long known um, economic process or um, uh, financial concept was at its core abstract. Uh, we also know, of course, from the earlier cases that mathematical formulas are abstract. If you pass that first test, then you're fine. Your patent is subject to uh, eligibility and you can uh, move on. If you fail that first test uh, and, and the court says, well, this is really an abstract idea at its core, then you move on to the second part. And the second part of the test, the court said, what you need to do is look at the limitations of the claim, what describes your invention in the written words, and you look at those both individually and collectively. And in doing that, what you really want to look for is an inventive concept that is more than the abstract idea itself. And if you can find that inventive concept, then your patent is eligible. And what, what has been the uh, action, if there is any, in the lower courts about applying the uh, test to software-based patents? Well, for software-based patents, uh, there have been a number of decisions um, trying to apply this test. And the vast majority of the courts um, applying this test to software-based patents and in particular software-based what I would call business method patents have found them invalid. Um, I would say at the uh, lower appellate court level with the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, the first six cases found uh, patents invalid. Uh, there was a recent case called DDR Holdings which uh, is the first case to uphold the validity of an internet-based patent. Um, at the trial court level, the courts have been uh, invalidating patents at a rate of about 75 to 80 percent. Wow. Do you expect that trend to continue or are we going to see a change? Well, I think without a change in the statute, I would expect that trend to continue. And what's really surprising about this, at least to me, is that the patents that have been invalidated are not only software method patents, but actually uh, machine patents patents that claim a computer programmed in a particular way to solve a particular problem. And applying this two-part test from the Alice case, the courts um, and the trial courts really have had very little problem distilling the inventions into a statement, a broad statement or abstract idea, and then looking at the limitations of the claims themselves and saying, you know, the things like memory, things like hardware, uh, things like um, uh, processors are all conventional at this point and don't add anything beyond the abstract uh, concept and so the patents are invalidated. So patent donors uh, are losing mm -hmm. patents uh, uh, at a very rapid pace today. Well, in the, in the meantime, before that changes, is there anything else that DCIA member companies or other participants in the Internet of Things industry can do to protect themselves? Well, uh, if it becomes necessary, of course, the reason why uh, DCIA members get patents in the first place is to protect their businesses, to protect their ideas. And, of course, you can only protect your businesses and ideas with a patent if you're able to enforce that patent. And this uh, whole issue under Section 101 has given would-be infringers um, a extremely important weapon in fighting those types of claims. I would say that if a DCI member has a patent and believes that somebody is infringing on it in a way that is going to seriously impact their business, then it needs to uh, very 
quickly and very thoroughly analyze this Section 101 issue. In that regard, there's a few things that I think can be done. First of all, it's very important to get out in front in characterizing your invention. The courts recognize that almost any invention at its core can be reduced to some sort of an abstract concept. But if you can get out in front on that issue and characterize your invention in technological terms, then I think you have a better chance. Um, other things that uh, you can do in this regard are um, a little bit more difficult, but I would say that in this process of characterizing your invention, it would be important to talk about not so much the, um, what the invention does, but the technological benefit mm. that it provides. So for example, if you had a networking type of software patent, the uh, important thing to do to save your patent from an ineligibility determination is to talk not so much about what the invention would do for somebody, but what the invention would do for the network itself. Okay. How it would make the network run faster, mm -hmm. or how, how it would make the network run more efficiently. If you can do those types of things, talk about what you couldn't do in terms of technology before your invention, and what you can do now with your invention, then I think you have a fighting chance. And of course, it's important to uh, work through those things with counsel that um, are up to date and knowledgeable on this rapidly changing field. Thanks very much for being with us. Thank you, Marty.